During my teenage years, I had a strong zeal to join monastic life. I was often attracted to solitude, although I now ask myself if I really was attracted to this way of life or I was just a social misfit. However, at 18 I visited with the Cistercians and somehow I thought it was a place I had been searching all my life. I told Brother Benedict, who was the then guest master, I assume he probably still is the one because at the time he had been guest master for 10 years. So I asked Brother Benedict to stay and that he should go ahead and inform my parents that I was no longer going back home. We kept on arguing and discussing about the whole issue and I kept on giving him, re giving him reasons why I should stay and be a monk. And uh, he finally triumphed when he said, you're just 18 and we only accept candidates from 21 and above. So he said, go back home and when you're 21 and if you still want to join us, then come back. Obviously, I didn't, right? Mm -hmm. However, during my novitiate year in California, the whole monastic life idea resurfaced. And do not tell Frank Grinko this. When we visited uh, the Kamadulai in Big Sur, I secretly took the contact of the vocations director. <laughs> When we got back to Santa Ines, it was a month, and I noticed that the contact was lying on my desk, and I never called. And I started thinking, I was like, well, maybe the Lord is trying to tell me something. So I grabbed that contact, and I put it in the trash can, and that was the last time I thought about monastic life. <laughs> so why did I share these stories? In his book, Reluctant Saint, The Life of Francis Assisi, Donald Sporto states that hermits lived alone, following the customs of the Byzantine tradition, which included solitude, silence, fasting on bread and water, prayer vigils, and to avoid idleness, craft work. But their desire for solitude did not mean they turned their backs on the world completely, for they were much involved in trying to elevate society's problems, serving as wandering preachers aiding visitors, helping weary travelers, and generally assisting the needy. St. Francis, who was deeply involved in the life of service to all God's creation, was at the same time a devout hermit. Consequently, he wrote the rule for hermitages, which was meant to guide those who were those brothers who wished to embrace the hermetical life. Francis also knew that the hermetical life was necessary for all who were chose to follow in his footsteps. For him, the hermitage was to be a resource that would help revive the spirit of the friars. As a matter of fact, the hermitage was to be a paradigm of our way of life. Brother Leo, in a mirror of perfection, while quoting Francis, wrote, If the other friars shall have fallen off somewhat from purity and honesty, I will that this place be blessed, and he was referring to St. Mary of the Angels, which was one of the hermitages, that, and that it rain forever a mirror and a good example of the whole order, and like a candlestick before the throne of God and the Blessed Virgin, always burning and shining. In the rule for hermitages, Francis, Francis mentioned two roles, that of the mothers and that of the sons, and these were to follow the examples of Martha and Mary as we read in the Gospels. Throughout the centuries and even today, the common understanding of the roles of, Mar of Martha and Mary is that the former represents the active life while the latter represents the contemplative. However, it is mesmerizing that in the rule for hermitages, Francis suggests that Martha should eventually take Mary's place and vice versa. Or to use his words, Francis says the sons, however, may periodically assume the role of the mothers. It seems to me that there is something about the story of Martin and Mary that we are missing, and Francis might have just picked it up. Martha was not always the active one, neither was Mary always the contemplative one. In Luke chapter 10, we read that Martha burdened with much serving, came to him, that is Jesus, and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me by myself 
And the Lord replied, Martha, you brought about so many things, uh, but only a few uh, Martha and Mary has taken the best part. And I remember when I was in elementary school, we were told that prayer is defined as talking and listening to God. So I realized that at this point, Martha had abandoned the active life. She had abandoned the service of cooking, and she came to the Lord. She was laying her complaint to Jesus. And after she had done this, she listened to the response that, she was going, that he was going to give her. And that is several times we come in here and we say that we we'll have lots of questions in our minds, we're discerning, we're asking the Lord for answers. And when we do that, we listen. That is the contemplative life, brothers. The contemplative life, brothers. And it's exactly what Martha did. Martha was also contemplative. And even if we go back to the, the time of the death of Lazarus, when Martha was with Jesus, she was reflecting about the whole idea of the resurrection. I mean, there's no way she could have been talking about these things if she didn't take time to, to, uh, to, to pray with the Lord. Furthermore, look, turning on to Mary, we realize that when Jesus came to Mary and Martha's house during the time of Lazarus, Mary stayed back home. And Martha came back to Mary, and we hear in John 11, verses 29 to 30, that Martha went and called her sister, Mary, secretly saying, the teacher is here. As soon as she, that is Mary, heard this, she rolled quickly and went to him. For Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still where Martha met him. So, at this time, Jesus is not just a teacher, but he is a visitor coming to the home of Martha and Mary. Mary took the active part. She went out to welcome a visitor who was Jesus to their home. There is no way that a contemplative will be doing such an act and that will be, uh, uh, that will be contemplation. No, that was that was a service. She was welcoming a visitor. And then also in the Gospel of John, in, in the same chapter, chapter 11, verse 2, he identifies Mary to the same woman who was crying at Jesus' feet as we read in the Gospel of Luke and wiping his feet with her hair. That sounds like care and service to me. And as we go further in John chapter 12, we read that Mary was anointing and putting perfume on Jesus' feet. That too sounds like service to me. I don't know about you guys. Therefore, brothers, I think that our life in itself is an hermetical one. We are all called to be mothers and sons. The hermitage should mirror our lives in the friars. It is our mirror of perfection. That is why our Father Francis says that even when we walk, our conversation should be as humble and seemly as if we were in a hermitage or in a cell. For where we are and walk, we may always have ourselves with us. For brother body is our cell, and our soul is the hermit, who remains within his cell to pray to God and to meditate on him. I never join the cistations, nor the Kamadolai, because the Lord already brought me to a monastic life. Are you a mother or a son? Either way, brothers, we're called to switch roles. That is what we are.